but I want to invite uh, Dr. Jim Wall to the stage. Would you make him welcome as he comes and as he shares today? Al, oh, thank you so much. This is, uh, I'm going to preach myself under conviction if it stays this loud, though, so. Uh, can I tell you, I just feel at home. Kim and I had the privilege of uh, planting and pastoring a church in Chesapeake, Virginia for 25 years before moving back home to North Carolina. And, and this is, we call it community church. This is community church. I mean, Kim, this feels like home to me. And, uh, and I'm so excited to, to have a chance to get to know you. Of course, I've known Pastor Rob for a while. And, and uh, we're just excited about what God's going to do. Uh, in whatever friendship and relationship and partnership we have in the days ahead. I do have a, a thought from the scriptures today that I want to share with you in the few minutes that I have with you. I promise that I won't keep you too awfully long. Pastor Rob said, uh, Jim, you take as long as you want. You speak as long as you feel like you need to. We're all leaving at 1145, but you do whatever <laughs> you want to do and <laughs> go wherever you want to go. And so we'll see what happens with that one. Here's my question, okay? You ready? I got two questions. If you could do anything for God, anything, stretch, if you could do anything for God and know for certain you would not fail, what would it be? You don't have to answer me, just think about it. If you could have any need met by God, with certainty, know that he's going to meet that need. What would it be? What would it be? You may think I'm asking unrealistic questions, that that's a stretch, that's, a, that's an impossibility, but I'm here to tell you without spending a lot of time on, on our history. Kim and I have been married 48 years, and, and God's taken us all over the world. And, and I, when I look in the mirror, I see an old 19-year-old from Bladenboro, North Carolina, it's a town so small in the southeastern part of the state that there's one traffic light and they don't bother to turn it on anymore. There's not enough traffic to need it, so they actually put a stop sign in that corner. And, uh, and that's where I'm from, and yet God has taken us all over the world because some, somewhere along the way, somebody convinced me that John 14... 12 and 13 was true. I think we'll put it up on the screens. We can read it together. Here we go. Let's read it together. One, two, three. I tell you the truth. Who, anybody know who's saying this? This is Jesus himself speaking. Here we go. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Now, that's not an entirely limitless promise because he said, I will do whatever you ask in conjunction with and under the proviso of that this is going to bring glory to the Father. So if you ask him to improve your corner drug business, he's probably not going to bless that. No glory to the Father in that one. But it seems pretty limitless to me when you think about what Jesus did while he was here. He healed the sick, right? He raised the dead. He changed the world. All of history is divided between the time before he came and since he came. Every time you write a check or put a date on an application, it's a reminder of this man who came, this God man who came in here. He's saying we're going to do even greater things than, than he did. You're thinking that's, there's got to be a catch to that. There's got to be a condition to that. You'd be right. And I've already mentioned one of those conditions that it brings glory to the Father, but there's another one, and that is in Matthew chapter 9 when he said, according to your faith will it be done to you. And that's what I want to share with you for just a few minutes this morning, this idea that according to your faith will it be done to you. In other words, you have to believe it can be before it can be. So let's just be honest. Can we just be honest among friends this morning? I've already told you I'm home, so we're just friends. Uh, we all have needs that haven't been met yet, even though we've asked God to meet them. Do you hear like this? We all have questions that we don't have answers for. Come on. We have doubts 
because we don't understand why things are working the way they're working or why they happen the way they happen. Can, can I get it? Is there any honesty in this room today? Come on. Is that, is that true? Is that part of the human equation? It is. So how do we become these people of faith that Jesus is talking about uh, who do greater things than he did? Maybe not greater in terms of, I mean, how do you do greater than raise the dead and heal the sick? But maybe greater in terms of volume because he said, I'm limited to what I can do to my geography. When I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to be in you and it'll be all over the planet. So greater in the sense of volume for sure. But the answer is often not get more faith because Jesus also said that, that all we need is a faith as a grain of mustard seed to move whatever mountains are in our way. So, so the answer is not get more faith. Have you ever wrestled with this stuff? Am I the only one that wrestles with this stuff? Um, so who is it that does more or greater things than Jesus ever did, more than they ever dared to dream or think or ask, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. The answer is people who understand that God's timing is perfect, people who put their faith in His ability and in His timing. Do I need to say that again? The people who do these quote-unquote greater things are people who don't just put their faith in His ability, they put their faith in His timing as well. Here's the principle, lean in, you're taking notes, you may want to write this one down. God works on time. He works in time, but not on our time. My schedule is often different than his. Now I got an amen, I got a smile, I got a head nod, because we all know that that's true. And I always like to start at a point of agreement before we dig in, but let's dig in now, because I want you to understand in the few minutes that I've got, I want you to understand, I didn't come to increase your faith, I came to help you understand perhaps the role of time in the faith that you're putting in God, and, uh, and we're going to go to the Scriptures for a couple of illustrations, one that shows the picture I want you to see, and the other of, of how to get to that place, some things to avoid, things not to do that I've mistakenly done, and perhaps you have too, uh, in order for these greater things to take place, okay? Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 6. Song of Solomon, of course, is the love story between Solomon and his bride, or man and, and uh, his bride, but it's also a symbol of Christ's love for the church, and there's just a lot of amazing symbolism uh, in the Song of Solomon, but my absolute favorite of all of it is chapter 2, verse 6, uh, where it says, I want you to get that picture, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. Everybody got that picture? Can you see that image? So this is a, a husband and his bride, and he's saying my left hand is under her head and my right hand is embracing her. So you get this image of the bride resting in the left hand of of her husband, whose hand is there, kind of back behind her head, her neck, holding her up, sustaining her, and then every now and then, his right hand comes in with a gentle caress on her face. You got that imagery? Come on, you got that imagery? And so let's be honest, guys, what we're all looking for is the right hand of God. What we're all looking for is those moments that he comes in and boom, wow, everything changed, everything's going to be awesome now. This is the miracle that we've been praying for. This is the answer that we've been looking for. Here's the solution that we've been longing for, and boom, there it is. But I need you to hear me. We often miss the right hand of God because we didn't trust the left hand. You see, in Scripture, there's two kinds of times. There's chronos time. We get words like chronology from it, which means the spanning of time. And then there's kairos time, which is those emerge in the moment, comes into the moment. Well, chronos, the passing of time, represents or reminds us of the, the left hand of God that sustains us, the grace of God that sustains us, that we sang about this morning, that I trust Him and I praise Him even when things aren't working the way uh, I want them to, or I don't understand everything. I still praise Him. Why? Because the left hand of God sustains us. But hear me, guys. It is really, really easy to forget 
about the left hand of God. It's really easy to take for granted the sustaining grace of God because we're so busy looking for the embrace that he wants to bring. But you have to be in position for the embrace by trusting in his sustaining grace. Is this making sense? So God bless you. Thanks for coming. That's, that's all I came to bring you. The challenge is this. God uses chronos time, sustaining grace time, to test our faith. Not for his information. He knows where our faith is and how strong it is. It's for our information. All right? But he uses kairos time, those moments that he intervenes, to build our faith. There's so many stories of that in Scripture that I could use to illustrate this. Biblically, Abraham was promised a son at age 75 before he was born at age 99, and then he was told to go sacrifice him. I mean, God often has those time periods in there where we have to trust him. Noah built a boat in the desert, took 120 years before the rain even started, and people made fun of him. Joseph had a dream that his brothers would bow down to him, and the next thing he knew, he was sold into slavery and eventually thrown into prison for something he didn't do before the dream finally became a reality. David was, was uh, anointed by the prophet Samuel 10 years before he actually became king. I mean, there's all, that's just over and over in Scripture. All of those people had to be found faithful, trusting the sustaining grace of God before they could experience the embracing grace of God. It, they had to be found faithful during the Kronos times in order for their Kairos moments to come. So let's just make it real personal before we get to the heart of how do we get there, which is ultimately what I want to talk to you about. This is a long introduction to a short sermon, okay? Um, I, I suspect that some of you are in a Kronos moment right now. Maybe you've been praying for God to move in your marriage and things don't seem to be getting any better. Maybe it's in your career, your finances. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in Grace Church. And its role in this community and in this world. I don't know, but I have a feeling that some of you are in that Kronos time where God's saying, okay, here's a chance for you to establish to yourself that you trust His left hand and His timing, but you long for, want to be in position for His right hand when it comes. So, I want you to pass the test. That's, that's what I want. That's what God wants. He, he has an amazing way of giving us these kinds of tests, but uh, if we fail them, we get to take them again because He wants us to pass. And so, what I want to do in the few minutes I've got left is I want us to go to a, a, a story in the Old Testament, probably one of the more famous stories of the Old Testament, perhaps you have some Bible knowledge, maybe you don't, doesn't matter. It's a fairly well-known, lots of movies have been made uh, about uh, this history. And it's, a, it's during a time when the nation of Israel had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years and, and in, during that period built a lot of the, the buildings that archaeologists are digging and excavating to this day. But after 400 years of crying out to God, 400 of 400 Kronos years, saying, God, when are you going to deliver us from this? He has. He's shown up in a series of miracles, convinced Pharaoh to let him go. <clears throat> and again, a series of miracles. They made it out of Egypt, and they're on their way to the land that God promised Abraham so many years before. But almost an entire generation of that nation failed to experience the Kairos moment of getting into the land because they failed the Kronos test of time. So let's see what they did. They did three things that I'm asking you, begging you not to do. 
three things that I've done, <laughs> and I'm asking you not to do them, and one thing they did, the few of them that made it, did. Is that worth a few minutes more of our time? The first thing that I see that they did is they let fear take over during that Kronos time. So, number one, don't fear. Say it with me, don't fear, don't fear. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 26 through 8 tells us the narrative of the story. Moses is actually remembering the event that's originally recorded in Numbers 14, but here he says, Moses said, you did not want to go into the land and you refused to obey the Lord your God. You stayed in your tents and grumbled, the Lord must hate us. He brought us out of Egypt just so he could hand us over to the Amorites and get rid of us. We are afraid. Now understand, he's delivered them from slavery. He's expressly said, I'm going to give you this land. They're on the threshold of that Kairos moment of walking into the land that flows with milk and honey, but they're too afraid to go in. Please tell me you're not making that mistake in whatever scenario you're wrestling with right now. So afraid that it won't work out that you won't even try. So afraid that your marriage won't work, you won't even go to counseling. So afraid that your finances are that mountain is too big to tackle that you won't even you go shopping. Please tell me you're not missing out God's best because you're afraid I, on a personal level. I remember vividly, 1996, our church was growing. It had grown pretty large, and uh, I realized that I was a poor leader. I, was, I actually went to my mentor and said, the church deserves a better leader than me. And he said, you're right, they do. But that doesn't mean it isn't you. What do you got to change? What do you got to learn? And so I committed to go back to school and learn leadership. So I applied to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary to their doctoral program in leadership and got accepted and got so scared, so convinced that I would fail if I tried, I didn't go. Four years later, I got a handwritten note from an administrative assistant in the school who said, I was digging through some files today, and I ran across your file that says you were accepted into the program, but I don't see any records if you haven't actually attended. Are you still interested? And here's what flashed through my mind. If I had not let fear stop me four years ago, this would be a letter saying, congratulations, you're graduating. And the four years passed anyway, and I had nothing to show for it but the fact that I let fear stop me. So please tell me, because many of these, during these Kronos uh, kinds of times, fear can take a hold. It's real. Please tell me you're not allowing fear to stop you from moving forward with what God has for you and wants for you. Because hear me, guys. Lean in. I'm going to move on. When you approach your Kronos experience with fear, you actually prolong your time in the desert. I eventually graduated, but it took eight years when it could have taken four because I let fear take hold. Second thing they did that I'm going to ask you not to do, I've done, is don't complain. Don't whine. Come on, say it with me. Don't whine. Don't throw any elbows. This is a no-elbow environment. You can't do that. Don't whine. Don't complain. Go back to verse 27. What does it say? You stayed in your tents and grumbled. The Lord must hate us. He brought us out of Egypt just so he could hand us over to the Amorites and get rid of us. God's deliverance was taking longer than they wanted, so they just started whining about it and complaining about it. Hear me, guys. Anytime you become impatient with God's timing, you're communicating that you don't trust his timing, and you therefore are prolonging the Kronos time. Do you remember Jesus' words according to your faith? My interpretation, not just in his ability, but in his timing. Will it be done to you? What I'm trying to say to you is anytime you become impatient with God's timing, you're actually communicating a lack of faith and prolonging the problem. But Jim, what I'm praying for is something really good. But I'm praying for my marriage to be better. Why wouldn't God answer that prayer? 
Maybe he's doing something in you before he can do that. But he's at work sustaining you while he does what you often can't see. You need to know, guys, whatever the reason is, you need to know that impatience does not speed the process. You ever got stuck in Raleigh traffic? I-40, 440, whatever road, I-1, whatever it is. So, uh, you need to get somewhere fast. You're running late for an appointment, running late for work, whatever it is. Did getting upset, blowing the horn, make the traffic move faster? Didn't, did it? <laughs> it didn't help at all. All it did was make you stressed and everybody else mad. That's all it did. I was stuck in traffic one time in Hampton Roads, Virginia, coming up on a tunnel that was clogged up, and, and it's just a parking lot, and, and somebody back behind me, outside my blind spot, was just blowing a horn, blowing a horn, and I'm going, oh, come on, dude, you're not helping, this is not getting us anywhere, just stop blowing your horn, and, and so we're inching up and stopping and inching up and stopping, and I'm, you know, looking at my watch, and, oh, come on, but the car to my left is getting closer and closer beside me, and still blowing the horn. And so I'm just going, oh, come on, dude, <laughs> this ain't helping, until he finally got up beside me, and I look over at him, and I'm ready to glare at him. I mean, I'm ready to, to send a message with my face that he's not helping the situation at all, and when I do, I catch his face, and I see a big smile on his face, and he's going, hey, Pastor Jim, how you doing? <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't do what I was thinking about doing maturing faith includes learning to wait on God's timing so when your kids come and say can we go to the park and you say yes but later what do they usually do <laughs> I want to go to the park well I said we would go I just said we'd go later but immaturity says later means no even when, in fact, you said yes, but later. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes later actually means no because we get busy and we never get around to it. And they're used to that. But God is the perfect father. And so when he says yes, but later, what does he mean? Yes, but later. Yes, in the right timing, when I finish doing this other stuff that I'm working on, yes, but later. So don't let fear define your decisions. Don't whine and complain while you're going through whatever it is you're going through. And number three of all, don't quit. Don't quit. At this point, go back to the original uh, 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 telling of the story, Luke, Numbers chapter 14. At this point, they were not only in their tents grinding, uh, grumbling and complaining, but they'd actually sent some spies into the land to try to check it all out. And, uh, the, and so Moses had, had named one spy from each of the 12 tribes, and they sent those 10, 12 spies in. Ten of them came back saying that they're giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers, and we can't do this. It's not possible. And, and, uh, and only two, Joshua and Caleb, were the only ones that came back and said, God told us yes, so the answer is yes. He's going to do it. Come on. You've got to trust him. But here they are hearing that report. Numbers 14, verse 1, 2, and 3. After the Israelites heard the report from the 12 men who had explored Canaan, the people cried all night and complained to Moses and Aaron, we wish we had died in Egypt or somewhere out here in this desert. We'd be better off in Egypt. Oh, that's a great idea. Give up and quit now. The tragedy is for an awful lot of people that in that moment that it that God is about to give you a kairos moment. Everything in you says, bail. This is taking too long. This is too hard. This isn't going to work. I'm out of here. I'm going to quit. And maybe, maybe that's what God sent this white-haired preacher to say to you today. If you don't hear anything else, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because it didn't happen quickly enough? Don't quit. They're ready to go back into slavery or even die in the desert because it didn't happen soon enough? 
I beg you, don't quit. I've seen far too many Christians pray for God to work, God to move, God to do something, and because the answer didn't come immediately, they said, forget about it. God must not be listening to me. He cares about other people. I see him blessing other people. Don't bless me. He don't care anything about me. And they stomp away mad and abandon their faith simply because it didn't happen fast enough. And I know it can be hard to wait. And I know it can be scary to wait. And I know none of us like to wait about anything. It can be painful to wait. But I think I mentioned that the chronos times of our lives are an opportunity for God to test our faith, not for His information, but for ours. And in the kingdom of God, if you fail a test, God cares enough about you and you passing the test that He lets you take it again. But I need you to hear this because if, if He didn't get your attention at this level and get you to trust Him at this level, He has a way of cranking it up to the next level to try to get your attention the next level. And if He doesn't hear, if you don't hear Him then, then He has a way of uh, cranking it up to the next level. There's a famous saying, I wish I could tell you who said it, but it's not original with me, but I've quoted it so many times, I'm going to tell you I said it. I've said it a lot of times. <laughs> Whoever said it first. Some people change when they see the light. Most people don't change till they feel the heat. And sometimes God's got to crank the heat up before He gets our attention. I'm telling you, change when you see the light. When you hear the truth, don't quit. Instead, trust His timing. The tragic part of this whole story is that an entire generation of the nation failed the test over and over and over again. They did seven laps in the desert until the entire generation died away in the desert. Only Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that came back and said, God said we can do it, therefore we can do it. The only ones from their generation that made it in to the promised land because they trusted not just his ability to keep his word, not just his promise to them, but they trusted his timing. That doesn't come naturally to us, does it? We are a nation of instant gratification. Okay, I'm, I'm going to show my age kind of as a closing illustration to make my point. Um, when I was younger, and I remember when I was younger, I do, I promise, um, if I needed to write a paper for school uh, or I needed to research something, uh, I had to get on my bicycle or in a car, and I had to go down to a building that was at a school or a college or some larger communities had them in the community. It was called a library. And you would go in there and you would look through the card catalog and you would hope they had a book on the subject that you were researching. And if you're old enough, willing to admit, you're old enough to remember those days. Okay? And if you couldn't find a book, then you would go to the desk and ask the librarian who knew every book in the building. Always amazed by those people. But... Uh, do you have a book on this subject? And he or she, usually she, uh, but she would say, well, we don't have one, but there's a library across town that does. I can send for that book for you. And so two or three days later, the book would come, and you'd get a call, and you'd go back to the building, and you'd get the book, and you'd look it up, and you'd hope that, anybody relating? I mean, is it true? And now what do we do? We pull out our pocket calculator, computer thing, and we Google it, and it leaves our cell phone and goes into outer space. It finds a satellite and bounces off of that satellite and searches the entire planet for the answer to our question. When it finds it, it sends it back to that satellite in outer space, bounces off, and comes back to our little pocket computer and if it takes more than three seconds, what are we doing? What is wrong with this stupid thing? I'm going to have to upgrade this phone. That's going to cost me a thousand bucks. There's something wrong here. What in the world is wrong with this stupid thing? It's going to space. Give it a minute, okay? 
That's how we roll today. Hear me, God's timing is always perfect. But at the end of the day, it's only we who trust his ability and his timing who get to see the promised land. Joshua chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Then Joshua gave orders to the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your supplies ready. Three days from now you'll cross the Jordan River and take the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now lean in, I'm closing, but I don't want to lose you, okay? You'll go to brunch in a minute. Do they still have a reason to be afraid? Well, sure, just across the river is Jericho, the most fortified city in the world. Of course they still have plenty of reason to be afraid. Do they have still have reason to whine? Yeah, we don't have the ability to scale those phenomenal walls. Do they have still reason to quit? Of course they do. But this time, the river is at flood stage. But this time, they decided to trust that at the right time, in this case, three days hence, God would keep his promise. And the result was that generation made it into the promised land. What am I saying to you? I dare say that in one area or another of all of our lives, we are in Kronos time right now. Commit with me, would you, to trust His sustaining grace while you wait for His embracing grace. Trust His ability and His timing. And watch him do amazing things. I love the psalmist when he said, Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. And some have told me that the hour is darkest just before the dawn. You might well be on the verge of a breakthrough. Don't be afraid. Don't whine. <laughs> Don't quit. Trust God's timing. Let's pray. Father, you see us. You know who we are. You, you know what's going on in all of our lives and every aspect of our lives. And you know we're here because we're a people of, uh, of faith or people who want to have faith, people who want to connect with you. That's, that's why we've gathered. And so would you help us to grow, to put our faith in not just your ability but your timing, to trust your sustaining grace all the while that we're waiting for your embracing grace, trust the left hand that holds us up while we wait for the right hand to come in your perfect timing. We'll thank you for it. We'll give you the praise for it. And we'll give you glory, even while we're waiting. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen.